So, um, okay, let's start. Hi, everyone. Thank you. It's nice to be working on the uh, a home field for a change. We're going to talk about um, composition, basically, and a lot of aspects of it. And if you have any questions, I think uh, Sandy will field the questions from where she is. And um, we'll answer them right then and there, or we'll wait until later, whatever is uh, most conducive to getting the answer to you. Anyway, let's start. So I'm going to hit my, uh, my name here and play. Okay, we good over there? Sandy, we good? You see this? Yes, we can. Okay, showtime. And uh, yeah, 30 whole years, I think longer than that, maybe 35. Jesus, God, man, where's, where's time go, right? Anyway, enough of that. <laughs> Compelling composition, that's the name of the game. Building blocks of visual design and thinking visually, thinking visually. John Shaw, who many of you know, uh, is, is one of my... Um, early mentors along with Pat O'Hara and uh, several others. But uh, John talked about photographics. When John would say, he would say photographics, the key word in that phrase is graphics. So I've always, uh, with um, the influence of Freeman and, and John and Pat and others, um, I, I think very graphically, because they do, in terms of shapes, design, that kind of thing. Had, you know, just had very good mentors. Anyway, here we go. And composition can be defined as the arrangement of object in an artistic form. What does that mean? I don't know. But we're going to talk about it this entire hour and a half <laughs> and see if we can uh, get you to think a little more um, simply. I think that's the uh, key to any kind of uh, strong design is uh, simplicity. So, okay, building block one, isolate and simplify. That was on my wall for years, just that phrase to get me thinking of... Uh, to think like that, find a subject, isolate it, and then simplify it. It's a very simple three-step process. And you generally start wide, you get it out of your system, big wide shot, get it over with, get it done, and then start grabbing longer lenses and reaching further inside to use your hardware. Isolate and simplify, getting tighter, and then ultimately getting the, uh, the image distilled down to its essence. Nice long exposure, a little different angle, but that's it. Pilings, water, sky, just elements. Very simple. And here's one at um, uh, the Congress Hotel in Cape May. We uh, normally get access to that when we teach there, uh, which is a great place to shoot, by the way. This is um, one of the great staircases uh, in, in the Congress. But then, you know, what's next? I mean, that's the, that's the big scene. Got out of my system, now where's the real shot? And I'm looking around. I'm seeing color bands and nice angles. We've got my 14 and got right up close to the railing. You see where it is? And then way inside, real close with the 14, just isolate, pull that color out, no window, just color and line. One of my favorite um, areas in Iceland, I can't say the Icelandic name, I just call them uh, a letter salad mountain things like this. Um, this is a great spot. If you notice on the very bottom left, there's a uh, road that goes around and to the very back. The back is about a five or six mile horseshoe. It, it, it's just enormous. And we drove back there and kept working. We got the original shot and then went back. It's, it's immense. It's immense. And uh, that's a real big waterfall, by the way. It's not small. These are very large areas. And just kept working the scene a bit more. Look for patterns. Just don't take one shot and leave. I'm guilty of that. Everybody's guilty of that. Just try to avoid it. Stay for a while. Just stay for a while. And look around and just see what hits you. And then there's the Game of Thrones shot. They did film there, by the way, uh, in Iceland. So work the area a little bit. This is a shot in uh, Gunpowder Falls, up around where we live here in uh, Marriottsville. Uh, use weather conditions to isolate and simplify your subject. In this case, uh, yeah, light snow is perfect because it separates the very busy background of the trees and the subject, it makes the subject stand out. And just to mention graphics, it's a big, uh, it, it, to me, that's not a tree, it's a big triangle. So I view these things as graphics. 
just happens to be a tree, but it, it's really a triangle. Fog is um, my native environment. I love, I love fog. I love it. Uh, I go to Worthington Valley a lot when I think it's foggy. It's a great place to shoot. My entire first book, I believe, is shot in Worthington Valley, which is crazy. But it's a great spot. Just great. Just got to go there a lot. Go there when it's at dawn. <laughs> you know, best time I find is the morning there. You get there when it's almost dark and just wait for things to happen. You're like, I know where to go, certain areas, but uh, it's a phenomenal place. This is shot at a school in, uh, in Eldersburg. This is a school parking lot. So there's like, uh, there's a, a parking lot, there's several buildings, there's several uh, sports fields. They might have but, started. I'm sorry, is there a question there? Okay, but not under fog conditions. Okay, bright sunny day, you can't find this. But fog, again, simplifies, it separates your elements and simplifies the scene. If you live close to the coast, say the bay, um, Ocean City, Rehoboth, that kind of thing. You have marine layers. Marine layer is a fog bank that's very low. There's blue sky above it in most cases. But a marine layer is a fog bank that can last for the entire day, um, which is great. That occurs on the uh, coast most of the time, around large bodies of water. And swirling fog. Any kind of fog, again, will separate the fact that it's moving that's IR, by, of course, infrared, by the way, my latest passion. I love infrared. But the moving fog creates this sense of movement and it separates the tree from the background. So I, I, I look for things like this. More volatile weather, um, good subject. It also makes the, the mountains more muted, so it separates those elements. Using a long lens. I've got the Nikon 2 to 500 millimeter, which I use a lot. On overlooks like this especially, you can reach way in, and it's not an expensive lens. What does that mean? Expensive is relative. Given the, um, the focal length of that lens, it's surprisingly inexpensive. $1,200, a lot of money. Pay for it. And for that kind of, that's a sleeper lens. If you don't have that, check it out. The Nikon 2 to 500 millimeter lens is uh, just an amazing um, addition to my uh, lens, though. I guess arsenal, you know. But you can reach way in. The Palouse is great for that. The Badlands, they have great overlooks. My most used lens on those overlooks is that, that zoom. Got to reach way in to pull out small scenes like this. Got to reach way in. This is not visible from the naked eye. Remember, it's, it's barely, you can barely see it. You need the lens with the attachment, which makes it a 750, to reach way out in the Palouse to find a single farm with stuff going on around it. The... Um, the Palouse is very, there's a lot of farms from Steptoe Butte. You know, there's a lot of them. So you need to, if you want to isolate one or a much smaller area, a longer lens is kind of what you're going to need up there. It also gives you a very clean, very uh, 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 isolated, simple composition when you do that. Okay, example with a long lens, um, shooting up, into, uh, up into the sky shooting up into a tree with sky in the background. We have all seen these very annoying little white specular highlights, right? Just white pin spots, they kill everything, but not with the long lens. At 500 millimeter, these small little specular highlights are these, these nice little out of focus orbs. These are specular highlights, very bright, very annoying, but not at 500 millimeter focusing in front of them. So the bokeh created from those specular highlights, it creates these very beautiful softballs. That is a function of lens. That's it. Long lens, wide open, will separate the subject from your background. I've got projects. You'll see Cole's project, which he calls Harbingers. I just call my single cloud, same basic idea. Cole Thompson has an entire thing on that. But yeah, single clouds are a great project for me. Here's one. Again, it, it focuses the mind. Anything that's one of something, one cloud, one, one thing, is, is very strong compositionally because it does focus the mind on your subject. There's no distraction. There's no like, what do I look at? You know what to look at. You look at that. You show them what to look at. Just waiting. Timing. Click. 
when you see a thing coming and you know what you want, just set up and wait. The cloud may break up. It may not. It's kind of 50-50, maybe 70-30 against you. But sometimes it'll hang in there. And then you get the cloud right as, you, right as it passes the peak of a tent rocks there in New Mexico. Low angle sun. Low angle sun. And that's why we go out when it's dark. That mountain behind that, um, that keeper's house is actually a volcano. Maybe a mile behind that, but the sun hasn't hit it yet. So the very first light gets the sure great uh, you know, the great formations and the keeper's house. And the background is dark for about two more minutes. And then the sun gets high enough to strike it. So you want to be there to watch it unfold. I don't chase light. I, I'm too old to chase light. I like to wait for light. My chasing light days are over. I want to get there and wait. <laughs> Again, single rock. The essence of simplicity is one of something. This is a, an arrow-shaped rock, the arrowhead, and it's pointing into the scene. So it'll direct your eye into the scene. Very clean, very simple. Shoot a lot of these. This, uh, this water, um, anytime water moves over a subject, it's different. That's why I shoot the exact same scene like this 50 times. Because all the water flow going on in here is going to be different. In this case, I got one that worked. If you look at this, this is just luck. It's a matter of just shooting a lot. This crescent shape mirrors this crescent shape. So I've got unity just by luck, by shooting a lot. And then you edit. Moving water is always different. Don't, uh, don't spare your digital files. Just shoot a lot of it. And then find one that makes sense to you, you know. We call this rainbow rock. You know, this is a crazy business. There's a rock in a stream in New Hampshire when the tide is right and the fall color is good and the sun's the right time of day. There's like 20 people right at this miscellaneous anonymous rock. We all know where it is. <laughs> you know, it's like party time. Hey, Doug, what are you doing here, man? You know, it's the middle of nowhere, you know. But everyone knows that this is a really nice subject in the right light. Lone subjects, one boat, a little texture overlay on this. I texturize a lot. I like texturing. It might not be apparent, but it does add to the atmosphere a lot of times. And that's the emotion of the scene when you texturize it a bit. And just um, single canoe with some texturing. Tells a story. It's got a feel to it. It's all that matters to me. We have turquoise, repeating color, and a single subject. Again, a single bike and beautiful color around it. But the point is to pick one subject. This is a uh, ice cube. It's roughly six feet long, but it's a big ice cube. This is in Iceland in July. Look at the snow. We do not get snow in Iceland in July for the last, uh, last quite a few years because uh, everything's getting warmer. Every time we go up there, the glaciers are receding more. You know, it's uh, get there while you can. Okay, obviously not one shot. It's simple. One fast shutter speed for the moon. Then put a 10 stop ND on and shoot one with the water slow. And then uh, just blend in using a, uh, a, uh, a gradient to bring in the, you know, the uh, moon. Easiest shot in the world. And Cole, you know, Cole does this also. You'll see some very smooth water and like one cloud that's razor sharp. That shot's impossible. So it, it does take two shots. Okay, one of the, you know, I think one of the best uh, landscape shooters around today, Mark Adamus, and he says, if you're not satisfied with your image, it's prob probably because you're having too much in the frame. Yeah, Tony, I'm guilty. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was sort of looking for a chance to jump in here. Anytime, I'm anytime. I'm monitoring, um, questions through the chat room. So anybody who sure. has a question, just uh, put it in the chat room. And we have one that was about infrared. And uh, this is from Gary Faulkner. Uh, hey Gary, you, what's up man? <laughs> do you prefer uh, the light source behind you when you're shooting infrared? Uh, not exactly, but that's uh, you're probably the best 
the best light that most people know about is front lighting your subject, which means sun behind your back or side lighting it. But I like IR in the rain. I think it's great in the rain. Um, yeah, but most people want to get that really uh, stark infrared. And again, uh, you know, low angle light from behind you or from the sides is the most dramatic. Uh huh. And we're starting to get some uh, questions about uh, the use of tripod or are you, is it handheld? I mean. I've got three arms. I've got two built in and one's called a tripod. Okay. I use it all the time, all the time. And Paul, I hope that answers your question. And Paul, yeah, well. rough. Roughly 99.9%. Oh. .9%. I mean, of course, you're going to need it all the time. But in general, I prefer to use it uh, and when I'm out in the field, absolutely. Absolutely, all the time. Okay, good. Thank you. Sure. And uh, he said thank you. So good. We're good. You're welcome. Thank you, Tony. Okay, just cut in any time. Just, just tell me okay, to shut good. up. And that's that's okay. no problem. Good. Okay. Okay, so uh, you probably have too much in the frame. You want to isolate and simplify. And also look up Mark's, Mark's webpage if you don't know him. He's pretty amazing. Okay. Building block number two, change perspective. The most boring height we have is our own. It just is. You know, get lower, stand up on something, shoot at an angle, get close. Just try anything that you haven't done before. Even getting down on one knee to shoot will change your perspective dramatically. Anything. So here's, here's some examples. Get low for drama. Low has an asterisk. Why is that? I'll tell you why. Because we ain't getting no younger. And it's easy to get low. <laughs> Tougher to get up. Anyway, but that's where the action is, folks. And luckily, we have cameras that have the articulating backs. So we can put the camera low and turn that screen up and stand up higher and look down at it. But the camera has to be low in many cases to get the shot that you're thinking of. And something like this, where I'm roughly about a, a foot from that uh, foreground, uh, 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 where's my thing? Roughly a foot from right about here. This is all razor sharp. All of it, all of it. Now, hyperfocal focusing, which is what this has, I'm focusing one third from the bottom, right here. And ideally, one third in front of that point is sharp, and two thirds behind is sharp at f16 or f22 but it has its limits if you want this thing this is sharp enough but if you want this thing razor sharp from front to back you will need the focus stack in most cases if you want it like if you want the back as sharp as the front you'll need a focus stack or take a second shot and just focus on on this and then mask that in to get razor sharp Two pictures, just bring in that, uh, that horizon line. But that's um, hyperfocal is great, but it does have its limits. When you're focusing very close, to get that to go all the way back at a distance may not, be, uh, may not work all the time. It's a thing called physics, I don't know. Anyway, lens at minimum focusing distance, where the drama is. You, you may want to learn, and I'm much later, I'm sure. Learn, learn the closest focusing distances of your most used lenses, your wide angle lens and your telephoto lenses. That's where the action is. Most of your sports, sports photographers shoot long lenses wide open. Why is that? Because the subject's sharp and the fall off beyond the subject is immediate. There's immediate fall off of sharpness beyond the subject. That's a function of that lens. It's important to know how your lenses work. You know, and, and I find the greatest drama in wide angle is to get low, get a foreground line, a big foreground subject, and then follow it in. This, this picture is, this, this image works because it's a big foreground and it pulls your eye back into the picture space. And that's a function of a wide angle lens, very close to your foreground at minimum focusing distance. It's an important thing to know how your lenses work. And it may change how you shoot. All right, get low and I can't read what I wrote here. Sorry, <laughs> let me move myself here. Okay, get low and close to exaggerate foreground. Yes, so big foreground is a function of getting low and close. 10, 12 inches, low down. Tripod's low. Big foreground, then that pulls your eye into the shot. 
also using this pointer. I call these pointers. And that's where you go, oh, and then takes you right into the picture space. Getting someone to spend time in your picture is how you sell work, by the way. All these techniques, that's what that's for, to make your pictures interesting. What did I do wrong here? Oh, there it is. Oh, God darn it, get back, sorry. Get back, there we go. Yeah, same basic, I've got too many people here. Oh, it doesn't matter, sorry, okay, I'm, I'm good. Um, yeah, same thing here. That, that foreground subject is, is, is not large, I promise you. It, it's quite small, but not at about eight inches away with a 14 millimeter lens. It changes the way you think. You'll see a, something, something like this and be like, wait a minute, man, it's, that, that's a good foreground with 14 millimeter. You'll see that. That will make a good foreground with 14 millimeter. You'll see it. And that's how David Munch, people like that get that big foreground, 15, 16 millimeter right on top of it and then it'll fall off of your background. Same idea here, 16, laying on my stomach, closest focusing distance, big hose in Cape May, big foreground. Then your eye just wraps right around, it goes into the picture space. That's how it's supposed to work, no, no distractions. It's a very clean way to get into the picture. That's all we're talking about. This is, I can't say this, fit, uh, fit, fit I can't even say it in, in Icelandic. It's my favorite um, stack in Iceland. Wide angle lens again, 20 millimeter. Can I move? There we go. Yeah, close, big foreground, then a rapid fall off to the uh, um, formation here. There we go. I'll get it, go back, okay. And we mentioned this, you should know the closest focusing distance of your shortest and longest lenses. Make that a mini project. Just put it on close focusing and then do a human zoom to go in and see how close it can focus because it'll change the way you shoot or it can. Always seek higher ground. The first two questions I ask when I get to a location is, um, are there any buildings I can shoot off? I mean, any buildings I can shoot off of? Like, you know, uh, uh, that I can get on top of and shoot down? Elevation. And are there any spiral staircases? Those are my two questions. Those are my two projects. But now, if you look at this, this is 24 millimeter. I carry that and a 70 to 200 with a 14 teleconverter. Because the next shot, look around the background here. See if you can tell where this shot's taken. Sorry, I'm like tied down. I understand if you want to leave. But then we would miss the slave over. The what? I am I am for dinner. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, let's go back. Yeah, anyway, God darn it, back up. Yeah, anyway, if you look at the very right side, about uh, maybe an inch from the right, you'll see the that mountain right there. And that's with the uh, longer lens. That's 350, and it's a, it's a 10 times zoom. So it goes basically from, anyway, moving on. Seek higher ground. And, and uh, when I see a church, there's always a graveyard. That's the nature of it. So once we shoot this, we drive down. And when we see the church with the gate, we have a shot. No problem. No brainer. You just walk down to it. Oh, there it is. You walk in and shoot out. These are not hard shots. So you gotta go there, look around, make a frame. Framing's critical in pulling your viewer into your picture space. Building block three, line and creative use of line. The example shot in Roaring Fork in the Smoky. It's a pretty nice rain. We had fog there, which is rare. I love fog up there. And what may make this unrecognizable to some of you is that it's been flipped horizontal. There's no water on that side of Roaring Fork. So it, I flipped horizontal. That's got two advantages. It, um, it looks different, even though it's familiar. And no one will know where it is, so they can't share it and people can show up all the time. So it kind of keeps it a secret by flipping it. Um, and it looks different.
probably shot there some of you guys, Leonard Cohen and Silk Mill, which is gone now, by the way, sorry to say. Um, who was the guy that owned that? Uh, God, I forgot his name already. But he, uh, Herb, Herb passed away maybe a year or two ago. And uh, anyway, it was a great 10 years and you get it while you can, right? But again, 14 millimeter lens with HDR. Why HDR? All we need HDR for is this, that window. With the big white hole, we have nothing. So we want to keep it viewable, no big hot spots, no crazy things to pull your eye away. Got a very clean perspective line with the 14 mil. And around 24 or wider, 14, 24 or wider, has a wide angle visual pull and also knock it off center. No need to, you know, to uh, go right down the pike all the time. Right down the middle, then move to the left a little bit. Got more on one side. I mean, don't get married to one position. Everyone does that. I do it. I got to remind myself, you got to move, you know. 20 millimeter, I think, is probably the, um, the widest lens that can maintain a perspective. And you get around 18, 14. It's kind of a fun, you know, fun house kind of a lens, which is fine. Fun house mirror lens. But as far as looking normal, 20 is about as wide as I want to go with that. This is a four, four minute infrared exposure. Strong diagonal, pulls you right to the subject. I may flip that. It may make more sense flipping it. I'll do that when we get done. Can't do it now. I use um, Singray, by the way, uh, filters and Kalari vision filters. I use Singray for the, um, the color shots and Kalari vision, which is an infrared company. And they make infrared specific filters. Um, for infrared. There are different light spectrums. If you try to use a, uh, a Singray 10 stop on an IR picture, it may overexpose. It doesn't read the same light spectrum as, as an infrared filter does. So you might want to bear that in mind. Up to about six stops, you're fine with anything. You can get around 10, 12, 13, 15 stops. It does matter uh, whether it's for the visible or invisible light spectrum. Hi, Tony. Yes, ma'am. Uh, for HDR, how many shots do you take? Not as many as I used to. They're getting very good at this stuff. Probably three is about right most of the time. Just okay. plus two, minus two average. If I need more, I'll bracket going up or down. But in general, that pretty much gets it most of the time because you can bring out so much, so much uh, in the software itself, even without HDR now, because the, uh, the, uh, the efficacy, the... Uh, 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 of lenses and software. It's pretty amazing what it can do. Amazing. Good, thank you. Oh, sure. Now, this is shot on a bright, sunny day. Everyone goes home on bright, sunny days. When I worked with Freeman one time, took a lesson with him, class up in the New Brunswick. So Freeman, you know, why are we at, at that 12 noon? He said, what are you talking about? I said, well, it's like 12 noon. He said, man, it doesn't matter when it is. I said, okay. And, he, and of course he's right. You gotta find subjects that are conducive to your light conditions, not the other way around. So if it's sunny, what you don't have when it's sunny are reflections and shadows. Pretty important stuff, you know. So when you have sun, go look for those things. You know, it's just learn to use what you have. And more line uh, up in the uh, Arizona, Colorado uh, Plateau. Uh, amazing place called White Pocket. Um, I think Chuck's been there and some others, but uh, yeah, it's a pretty great place. It's getting popular. Got to find new places now, but it's still pretty amazing. Tough to get back to, which is kind of good. You know, everything points. Everything points towards something. This is uh, the reason. Uh, the uh, Palouse is our favorite spot in the fall because of this. Okay, you get the. Um, the lines that you don't get when everything's green. They have to harvest it. You can also get places like this that you cannot get to when everything's planted because there's crop planted here. So once they harvest everything, you can walk up after you ask permission, of course, always without exception, to go up on property. And they'll let you go up if you just ask and get different angles you cannot get in the springtime. That's kind of nice. These are garbanzo fields because the uh, fields of are dark, they're black. They leave a black, you know, fallow field like this. 
or plow field, I mean. You know, stuff like this, you don't get this in, in June, May. You get these, these great patterns, uh, graphic, just in, interesting. This stuff, yeah, I love this. This is my kind of photography. That's why I you know, like the Apollos in the fall. More lines everywhere in the Palouse, incredible. These are, these are called, actually called, uh, called wind rows. They're about 18 inches tall. They're not just, uh, these humps here are high. Might be um, probably a foot or a little more. It's kind of a hump, which gives it a uh, three-dimensional quality, which I like a lot. We look for these, they're called wind rows. They have this, uh, this three-dimensional feel to them, you know. They're plowed that way for a reason. I think they harvest the hay for, uh, for um, feed, something like that. And don't let this happen to you. Okay. Um, there's a, a small hill behind me <laughs> that I kind of went and scouted first. And, hey, I'm okay. And then took 10 minutes to shoot. And by that time, a car came down the road and I took one step and it came flying by me. So I need a spotter there for now on. I know I need a spotter. I can't do it alone. But um, these kind of shots are extremely marketable for like uh, your road atlases, book covers, you name it. They're nondescript. Any kind of road shot tells a story. It's like, where's it going? And your eye follows the road and it, it, it stirs your imagination. That's why road shots are so popular in general. It's like, where are they going? You know, it's a mystery to them. Building block four, separating elements for clean composition. Man, separating elements is so critical to me. You know, it's like when I play music. Yeah, it's funny. There's an exact you know, parallel to music. When you want to play any instrument, you, uh, you want to separate the ideas. So it all just like mesh together and make no sense. So you have to separate your ideas. It's exactly the same. Yeah, I found that exactly the same in photography. If you don't separate things, things get merged and they don't quite look right. So the separation concept came to me from music. And it was uh, a transferable to a photography immediately. Oh, yeah, I get it. I got it immediately. You want to separate things. Now, what's the first thing you see in this next image? Be careful. Ready? Where's your eye go first? Go. Okay. I can't ask questions, but I'm assuming that it didn't go up here or it didn't go over here. It didn't even go here. It probably went here because that is the highest point of contrast in the image. And that's how you direct how your viewer goes through your picture space. It wouldn't be uncommon for me on a much deeper scene that I'd create a little more contrast here and then maybe a little more contrast here and a little contrast back here. These are stepping, visual stepping stones that pull your eye back into the picture space. You just do a selection in Photoshop and a little contrast. It'll pull your eye back to that area. Uh, separation, if you look at the, the um, you can't see me point, <laughs> the horizon line here. I want this very clean. So I cloned out some leaves. But I want that to be very, very clean. with No, no distractions there. And then added a texture and a little bit of glow to the red and make sure I was framing everything so it made sense, had the rhythm right, the whole bit. And then moved on. But the main thing, but to get this horizon line clean, very clean. Image swipe and separation. Uh, this is set up on the tripod. It's a swipe. So you're moving the camera during the exposure, you know. <clears throat> Excuse me. Give me one second, sorry. Uh, so you set up on a tripod. What was important to me on this shot was to uh, maintain separation. So I composed it, so I'm not gonna waste, all, waste time on this, but in general, every tree, every one, every one from the smallest spindly tree to whatever has its own space. Nothing's merging at the point. Get me out of the way here. Yeah, nothing is merging all the way across. So once I'm set, or you know, across, or as we say in Baltimore, across, nothing does that. Everything's very open, very clean. Then when I'm ready, I release the camera Release, release the tripod and let the camera swivel freely, but it's still mounted on the tripod, but I can move it. 
So it's a stabilizer. So I've got my shot, I loosen it up and then just move. At two seconds, 1,001, 1,002. So it's locked, I hold it, unlock it, 1,001, 1,002. So all that separation remains. Hope that makes sense. I want things very clean, very distinct, very separated. Oh, God darn it. There it is. Wait a minute, what two of them, too far. I'll get this figured out sometime today. Here we go. This is uh, Rock Harbor in uh, Cape Cod. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, yeah, just separation. That's all it is. That's all it is. Here, 300 millimeter at F4. What's important here is that at F4, all that is sharp is right here. Right here. And my, my basic uh, motto for sharpness is um, it's sharp enough. How sharp it got to be to get the message across, right? It's sharp enough. I don't want this whole thing sharp. I don't even want this whole flower sharp. You get the point. It's sharp here. So the eye rests around here. Everything else works fine. It's sharp enough. Using a tall tripod. I got several tripods. One goes to eight feet tall, which I use on this shot. It stays in the car. It's not a hiking tripod. It has some weight to it. But the height I find essential because it gets me up. If you stand on a boulder that puts you up in the air, and the tripod can't get where you are, then it doesn't get high enough. You know, it's got to go where I am. And getting high a lot, shooting down, is one way to, uh, to separate the top of that boathouse from the darkness back here. So I got real high and shot down, which gave me the separation. And I do that a lot, but you do need a tripod to get you up there. You know, I shot uh, Whidbey Island in, in uh, Washington State. That's the Olympics behind us there. We're over there. This is the um, the late Great Boneyard in uh, Botany Bay outside of Charleston. These are all gone now. We had about a decade with them, maybe longer, 15 years maybe. Then they got a series of storms. I think uh wasn't Sandy. One of them just took them away, man. Boom, they're gone. They are gone. Because uh, these are dead trees. You know, the trees don't live in salt water. So they kept getting, uh, over the course of years, I noticed uh, the year before this, or the year, the year before they went down, went gone, that long exposures weren't working. And I talked to uh, some friends of mine who were shooting there, and they said, yeah, what's, what's going on with the long exposures? And then it occurred to us that, oh, they're loosening up. The trees are loosening up. And then next year, they were gone. They moved during the exposure. Building block five, repetition, repeating an idea. These are like benchmark techniques that always work. Repeating an idea. Foreground subject and everything, it falls off. Repeats and falls off as it goes back. You can shoot them stop down also, but I find that if they're softer as they go back, it's more of a, uh, looks like a um, spider web shot out of focus. There's real soft orbs going back as you go. Repetition. This tree is crazy. It's going all over the place. So you just crop it. You just crop it so it fits. Don't crop it at the edge. Crop into it dramatically so it looks like you intended to do it. And then no one will notice. No one will notice. If it goes to the uh, very tip of the tree, people will notice. It'll pull the eye. But the more it's truncated, the more it, no one notices. Repeating an idea, you know, the texture of overlay shot in the Palouse. These things are incredible to photograph. Beautiful. I mean, uh, storage bins. One of the great cottage lines in, uh, in Cape Cod. Um, this is shot twice in the same day. This is a shot one. And then sunset, when I went back, uh, was remarkable. Why do I say that? Because it went from this to that. And if you notice, the light on every single house is identical. Just still can't believe. That didn't last too long. There at the right time, I, I kept staring at it like, what am I seeing here? I couldn't believe everything was like so even. And so uh, exactly repeating the idea, I couldn't believe it. So lucky to be there, I guess. Repeating an idea. This church is very crowded, but not up there. I mean, maybe it is, 
but they're spirits. We don't see them. But this crowd is, uh, church is very crowded. It's the, uh, the uh, uh, iconic church in Reykjavik, which always has people in there. It's fantastic. But the shot is up there where the patterns are, repetition, it's all up there. So it was easy. Nobody was up there. Repeating doors on Ellis Island. We're going back in there, I think, uh, later this year or next year. So if you want to go back to Ellis with us, uh, send, me a, send me an email. They bagged that for this year, and we're talking uh, soon about going back in later this year or next year. It's a great place. But again, all the doors are the same. One's got a little aberration. Repeating flowers, the easiest repeating subject. Flowers are perfect for this. Lens baby shot, doesn't matter. It could be a straight shot. Repeating flowers are, are baked in the cake. They're everywhere. Men's room. Yeah, always have your camera with you. <laughs> yeah, never know, right? Tony? Yes, ma'am. I have a question uh, from Beth. What are your favorite textures to use? Oh, Beth, I don't know. I've got thousands. But I use the same five or six all the time. <laughs> I use uh, the, well, I'll shoot my own. You should shoot your own, of course. But the ones that I think are the most organic are flypaper textures. And there's others, but I've known those guys for a while. They're very good. And they'll have a certain, um, for example, if you use a, 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 a hard texture, like a, a picture of shower glass, it's just too much most of the time. Something like fly paper, or there's, there's other ones that are much more um, uh, French kiss. They're, very, they're more subtle. But there's still a search one like uh, textures that will be everywhere. Find ones that you like. But I use fly paper most of the time in the same five or six, mainly all the time, you know, to gravitate to the same ones that I like. But uh, fly paper textures, there's a fly paper textures. There's a link to my website, small little discount there. Good. And this is, I'm sorry, is, is, is there anything else? No, I'm sorry, I just said thank you. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> Shot in St. Margaret's Bay, repeating boats. These are things that we look for. It's rather than walking around with an empty head, which is fine. In some cases, things come to your mind when you don't think about anything. But if you're framing in a frame, repetition, threes, things that I'm showing you now are things that are constantly moving around in my head, always. Where's the frame? Where's this? Where's that? It, it keeps you occupied. It keeps your mind in the game. Your mind in the game, so to speak. Okay, second half or second, I don't know, nine sixteenths. <laughs> thinking visually, thinking visually, scale, creating visual drama. Yes. The eye goes to the sun first and it goes down. Low horizon lines, pull your eye down. And then if there's more going on, you'll go beyond the subject. So without the deer, this is a nothing shot. Who cares? Who cares? You know, but with them, you have a point of interest. It almost pulls your eye away from the sun because there's actually living creatures there. The important thing about deer like this is that if they're looking right at you, okay, they have no profile. So it looks like they have just like stumps for heads. There's no profile. So all three of them turn at the same time, which I was waiting for because I know a, a picture of a deer look, looking at you is a silhouette. There's no shot. Just, just uh, there's that, you need, need a profile. So I waited, they turned and ran. Got one shot. But they are one shot, boom, they took off. So get it while you can. And luckily they cooperated. But then low horizon, the pulls your eye down and then up into the frame. That's all this is, down and then up into the frame at, um, forget the city name, <laughs> northernmost city in, uh, uh, in Iceland. Sigvisfjura, something like that. Anyway, um, that's a pilot boat going out. It's a beautiful city. It's got a great history to it. Again, small sugar house and then the scene. Now, without that rolling rhythm here, there's no shot. There's no shot. It's a straight line, which is boring. Cut in the frame, who cares? But the rhythm of those hills is what makes this work. One sugar shack, nice rhythm here, and there's an infrared sky, some clouds, and that kind of thing. 
I would process this differently today, which is the whole point of what we're doing here. We're always going to reprocess things as we get older and mature as, as photographers and using software. Uh, you'll process the exact same shot 10 different ways throughout your life. As you learn more, as software gets better, it's getting very good right now. So this wouldn't look anything like this if I process this now, this shot. Would be different. Sky would be darker. Clouds would be brighter. Uh, add more contrast to the house and more detail in the hills. Anyone use radio filter? Radio filter is an important tool, in my opinion. I'm getting ready to do a, a little free thing on that pretty soon. The radio tool's got a lot of things going on with it, but in this case, the image was processed to look like this. That dark. And then you see it here. It's bright, then it gets dark. That, that's a radio filter. Brought it into about maybe here, and then made the outside darker. And then you could flip it, made the inside brighter. The exact same radio. There's ways to do that. It's a very, you can actually process an entire image with a radio and, and grad. It, it's an amazing set of tools. That's what's happening here. And of course, the scale. It's a small little power shed down here. The farm is over here somewhere. Small little power shed. But it's the white roof makes it, the white roof makes it stand out. So your eye goes right to it. Okay. Yeah. I have like, I've got a couple of questions. I'm sorry. One yes, none. Is, no one, problem. One is the what is the difference between a radial filter and a circular polarizer? Okay. I was not clear. A radio filter is in Lightroom. It's a digital filter. Okay, there's no hardware filter. And the other question is what again? Sandy, I'm sorry, I forgot. The difference between that and the circular polarizer. Well, well yeah, that's a screw-in filter. Yeah, you know, that you turn and it tends to remove glare as you do that. It could also function as a one or two stop ND, but I wouldn't use it for that, but you can if you're in a pinch. But in general, it just darkens. It, take, it, it tends to remove glare. Okay. They're like apples and oranges. Okay. One's That's software perfect. and one's hardware. Okay. And that was from Jim Horn, and he said, got it. Thank you. And we oh, have sure, an Jim. interesting question. Um, Tom uh, Anderson is asking, what motivated hey, you to go to all of these fabulous scenic places? Is this for commercial interests? or personal interest or both? Well, it's kind of everything. This is where we uh, teach a workshop every year, every, every one to two years. We have friends over there we work with over in Iceland that uh, comes with us. But I just, um, this is the job. You know, you learn people where to go and you research yourself and there's some footwork involved and a little research. But uh, I mean, Iceland's Iceland. Get in the car and drive and you win on that. That's easy. Yeah. Um, but um, just getting out, man getting out to see what places uh, like go to spots and then walk around. Just don't go there and leave. Walk around and see what else is there, you know? Um, but yeah, these are classic spots that, you know, that I go to basically. Uh, White Mountains in the fall, Iceland. They're on my website basically. You can go back and see where I go. It's all the same spots every year for the most part. So now, Why do I do that? Why do I go to the same spot every year for the most part? Because the spots don't change. We do. We do. So you always find new stuff. Been doing Smokies 25 years, I, st I still find new stuff Yeah. The Smokies, still, so always. What I was gonna say is if they wanna go to these places, they can uh, go to your website and join you on one of your upcoming photo tours, right? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm not a good salesman, but yeah, please check my website out and uh, if you have any questions, let us know. I, I, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, uh, um, okay. I have another interesting question. Have you been shooting during the lockdown different than you normally shoot? Oh, not really. I've been going out to, um, we live in a nice area. Nice for me because it's, um, it's in Eldersburg, central, north central Maryland. And what's right around us within like, you know, 10 minutes. Um, what's that? Uh, What's that hospital? A Spring Grove Hospital is here. It's like half abandoned. You know, it's got old buildings, so I, I go shoot there. Uh, Slacks Road is a road that goes between Liberty and 26. It's almost a dirt road. It's got trees back in there. They're almost cutting those down now, but that's uh, 
that's a nice little road, a lot of fog back in there. And of course, Lock Raven is phenomenal. You go in there forever. And Worthington Valley. So I went out to, um, the other day, it, it, it's, uh, it's on my Facebook page. Took a day and went to um, Slacks Road and uh, Spring Grove and, and, um, and somewhere else, right in the neighborhood, a, a Freedom Park, which has great trees within like five minutes from where I live. And just shot there, all infrared. And um, yeah, that's kind of where I go. I'm close to home here. Good. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I look for RGB. Anybody see it here? Red house, mm -hmm. green something, and then blue hills. RGB, good color combination. Low horizon again, the eye goes to the house and then goes up to those hills. Amazing. RGB, red house, green grass, and sort of a uh, RGB, sort of blue, cyan, blue, yeah, it qualifies. I started adding a person a few years ago. And it's easy because these are all done on workshops. So I find a good scene and wait for your client to walk through the scene. Press the button. <clears throat> and you'll find Cole does a lot of that with the he'll have one person somewhere. It's, uh, it's kind of a thing right now. People like adding a person to the scene like here. For example, this, this waterfall, which is called Godafoss, it means falls of the waterfall of the gods. And uh, they're pretty much accurate on that one. Incredible waterfall, I love it. My favorite one there. But look at the person, it's almost shocking. It looks like it's a huge waterfall, then you see a person. Mm -hmm. And it's not that huge. It might be 30 feet, 35 feet. You know, that, that's not tall for a waterfall of this magnitude. So it gives you a sense of scale. It's also kind of surprising to see the uh, 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 size of a, uh, of a person juxtaposed to the uh, immense waterfall. Thinking visually number two. Thinking visually number two. S and C curves and spirals. Things that I look for. Spiral staircase. Anything like that. Also called visual rhythm. It's got what I call visual rhythm. The rhythm of photography. Shot in Iceland. Uh, just to let you people know that um, they stopped letting us go in there as a group. We did it for 10 years. And they stopped. Iceland, Iceland does not play around with people. They don't warn you for 10 years. They tell you once. Then they block it off. They get hard to get to. That's why a lot of stuff's still there. Um, we could drive around this power plant forever. No problem. Tour buses came in, left some garbage. Just if things weren't quite right. They said, that's it. Done. No more. So bear that in mind when you go out and tell people, you got these places can go away. This is a, uh, what I call a, a um, spec shot. You know, we're kind of in a hurry and we're on the main drag, which is over here. I said, man, pull over. There's something here. Got out, took one shot, got back in the bus. Wide angle shot included more than I intended to use. I like the raw material. So one shot that I cropped down to was this. There's two or three more. But again, this is raw material. And again, cropping is a viable compositional option. It's not cheating, whatever cheating means anymore. I have no idea what cheating means. I have no idea. These are all tools that you use to realize what you want the picture to be, you know? So often I'll take just a big shot and come back and look at it. And I'll find other shots, and sometimes I won't, you know, but that's an option. You can crop down with the D850 characters of that ilk, that high resolution, you can crop almost to anything, you know. A lot of latitude. S curve, C curve, this is the, the uh, Mount Washington Hotel in New Hampshire. I love this place. We're gonna stay here, I hope, sometime before I croak. It's a great place. We're always working, gotta leave. But I wanna stay there with Sue one time, one time, <laughs> anyway. It's phenomenal, old, historic. Um, I think uh, there's a World War II meeting there, some uh, heads of state, very important uh, place. I like when it rains, because when it rains, you get this, you get reflection, you know. Shooting in the rain is fantastic. City streets, 
It just all lights up with reflection. It's great. This was actually cut during, um, it might have been during, not Sandy, one of the storms years ago. It might have been Irene, something like that, one of the terrible storms. The great thing, the great, I'm sorry, yes. Is there a question? No. Um, the great thing about living on the coast or close to the coast is that any kind of major storm gives you a whole new environment. This was cut by a storm and now it's gone because of the storm. These landscapes come and they go on the coast. They're phenomenal. Big storm, new landscape. It's tremendous. This is about four minute exposure and the S-curve was uh, a direct function of a storm that created that. S-curve in Cape Cod. Um, let me just say to you, this, this area is called Gray's Beach in Cape Cod. This is definitely a scene that's a, a function of the tide. If the tide's too high, you don't see any grass. It's just all covered up. If it's too low, it's black holes everywhere. A middle tide is when you get enough grass and you get the warm light cutting across. It, 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 it's better at middle tide. Middle tide, you get everything. So researching your tides in Cape Cod. We only go there. We go there based on tides. That's how we base when we go there on our workshops. High tide, you don't have a whole lot in Cape Cod. You want middle or low tide. And an S-curve here, see it? Multiple exposure. There's your S-curve, right there. Now, you can't tell it's vignetted, but it is. Here, see where it's darker? Because that pulls your eye into that center spot. That's how I use vignetting. So your eye goes right down here. If this, would, if, if this were as bright as this, you would be all over the place. So darkening the edges pulls your eye in to look at what I think is important, which is this. Take a little walk right down here and through that. Oh, what happened? Had to go back. Yeah, walk through here and right through that door. The other garden. Charleston is phenomenal, and it's a great infrared city, by the way. A lot of graphics here. We have threes, three sections. We have big C curve, a circle, god darn it, and a circle, a lot of graphics. That's all it is. Picture of shapes, nice fall color, just all fell down one day, but graphically, C curve, circle. Now this is interesting. This is um, a picture of a visual grid. We all have our visual grids. We all see things a certain way no matter where we are. That's how we're wired and you got to fight to get beyond that. So this was shot in New Hampshire again, right around Rainbow Rock. This is shot in uh, the Painted Desert. Look at the shape. It's the exact same shape right through here. I'm thinking, man, that's crazy. But we tend to put things, we see things a certain way. Our visual grid wants us to see things a certain way no matter where we are. So I like this shape, whether it's in Arizona, whether it's in New Hampshire, I look for that shape it appears. S-curve, C-curve type of movement. And exact same thing here. Big S-curve, four minutes of exposure. Isolated, stuff going on around it. I don't know what was going on around it. That's a different shot. This is this shot. I'm very cautious not to include too much, what I feel is too much, because it takes away from the viewer wanting to see what I want them to see. Big C curve. This is a Nikon likes this shot because of the road. You seldom see roads that look like that. That was a freshly paved road in the Smokies and a really nice spring rain. Wasn't a whole lot of dirt and it looks like it looked like a mirror. Unbelievable. That's on the way to a tree mine, those who like the Smokies. Just more curves. It's Point Judith in, in Rhode Island. About four minutes of exposure. You can see the S-curve. It's right here. Right here. Tony? And spot yes, ma'am. Uh, a question from Jim Vogelin. Sure. Uh, do you have a dedicated IR camera or do you use filters? 
I've got two dedicated cameras and a filter. I've got a whole show on that, but I'll be brief. And I'll be brief. I will be brief. The, um, I've got a dedicated 720, which I use about 95% of the time, and a dedicated 590 with a 720 filter. Okay, what that means is I can take that camera with me on the road and leave one camera home. So you can add a, uh, a filter that Calari Vision and Life Pixel make. If it's on a lower number, it can work going higher. So a 590 camera will be a 720 camera with the 720 filter. A 720 camera will become an 830 converted with an 830 filter that you screw on, right? Hardware filters, not the other way around. A 720 will not be a 590 with a 590 filter. It only goes higher. Does that make sense? Sandy, right? I, well, not necessarily to me, but I'm not a good judge. So how about you, Jim? Jim. You, if you want to unmute yourselves, just press the space bar. Jim Boglin. Okay, I'll see that's fine. But the point is, you're, you, I've got two converter cameras and a filter, the, um, but you can get a, a infrared filter if it's higher than your camera conversion put that filter in the camera will become that filter. 590 camera with the 720 filter is now a 720. But a 720 camera with a 590 filter is not a 590. Yeah. It only goes up. Okay, got it. It's kind of hard to explain. I'm, fo I'm following and if I follow, anybody can okay. follow. Okay. Anyway, spirals. That's on my uh, kitchen table. And then that's, our, that's at our hotel in Cuba. These are things that I look for. I search for spirals. I think they're remarkable subjects. It's called the Rookery in Chicago, one of the greatest architectural cities in the world. If you ever shot Chicago, man, it is phenomenal. What a great town to photograph in. Just great. It's called the Rookery. And this is uh, on my table here, my little macro studio, like two by two feet, not pretty big. But again, the Nautilus pretty much defines spiral. And this has uh, three or four macro flashes and front light and back light and all kind of stuff going on. Cabrilla Lighthouse mm. in San Diego. Very, very small, but not at 14 millimeter. It looks big at 14 millimeter. Okay, this, is, uh, this has a name. I call this uh, Conrad's Spiral. So I said, what? What's that called? This is from the bottom looking up. And someone said, what hotel is it in? I said, it's called Conrad's Spiral. What do you think hotel it's in? Anyone know the Conrad Hilton? Okay, got it. Anyway, this is from the bottom up and it's from the top down this way. So do this, walk up nine floors and shoot down. One of my favorite shots in Iceland. Because this, a couple things. Watch out for your feet, number one. Number two, more importantly, I can fix that. More importantly, this has to be in bright overcast because this is the shot. If there's too much contrast, that becomes a black hole. It's a black hole. It's got to be bright overcast, evenly lit, and then you see everything. And again, watch your, watch your foot. <laughs> <laughs> number three threes and thirds yes thinking asymmetrically always threes three cabanas of course texture overlay also and then we have the rule of thirds the suggestion of thirds the idea of thirds call it what you want all it means is get things out of the middle sometimes not all the time just sometimes and that's done by drawing a, a line a, it, it's just an imaginary line god darn it an imaginary line here where you have one third to the left and two thirds to the right. That way there's, there's a, an asymmetry created and that basically uh, gets things off center and creates more visual interest. But then we have threes and thirds and you got to wait for these. What am I waiting for here? I am waiting. I got my, my separation. They move around, I got that, but I'm still waiting. Why? Did my thing die here? God, hold on a second. Did 
Did I lose people? You still there? No, we're we're all here. Everybody's here. We're, we're here. here. Okay, I leave my paddle. All right. So anyway, the uh, let me go back. Okay, we can see this, right? I hope. Okay. Okay. What I'm waiting for is for the heads to change. So I've got this guy and this guy looking this way. So I gave this this bird enough room to look into the frame. And then this one needed more room to look out. So I waited until they were positioned right so they didn't seem cramped or too close together or looking the wrong way. So I waited. And then when they moved, took three or four shots and they flew away, whatever. But waiting for a specific thing to happen. If one of them are looking at me, it doesn't work. They've all got to be profiles looking in different directions. So I'm waiting for that. So the shot's in my head first. Doesn't mean I'll get it. It means that I know what I'm waiting for. And whether I get it or not, that's the luck of the draw. This is a sunset in the Palouse, the final harvest. Um, these shots, this is very lucky actually. We got to the top of step toe and Sue was there. And I just uh, looked and said, grab your camera now. Don't talk to me, get your camera right now. Because when this guy gets here, they're done. And I knew that, they were done. It's their last round. So we, she hurried up and we got a few shots. But as soon as this guy left, they did that. They all drove off. So again, waiting. And, and, and know your gear so you can set up in a hurry and take your shot. Again, there's three. Three here. 15-minute exposure. 15 minutes. Ocean never stops moving. That's the ocean. It looks like slate, like a slate bed. When you get beyond four minutes, um, it's a whole new world with long exposures. And notice the clouds here. What long exposures do are they record the passage of time in real time. So what's happening with the clouds, you can see them here, is that there's sort of a stutter step going on. You see, God darn it, man, I gotta stop doing that. What happens is the clouds aren't that smooth line you see all the time. God darn it. They stop. They move and they stop. They move and they stop. They move and they stop. So I'm recording the cloud movement over 15 minutes and rather than the smooth clouds, it looks like they start and stop, start and stop. So it's a very unique thing that, that I found interesting. You can see the passage of time in a long exposure. It's pretty amazing. Color infrared, one of our favorite secret spots in the Badlands National Park. And then different year, do black and white infrared. Whoever asked, this is uh, the 590 camera. And this is my 720. Dedicated cameras. Series of threes. Oh, this is threes, isn't it? Three. Check this out. What I meant to say here was that rather than getting three trees in a row, I look for space, again, asymmetry. So I have one tree, little space, and then two close together. One tree, little space, two trees together. One boat, a little space, two boats together. These are things that I look for, just like you. I have no control over this. <laughs> Got two shots and it ran off. But again, I saw it. I grabbed my camera in a hurry, in a hurry. These things don't play around. And then once they stopped milling around and separated, I took two shots. Click, click, she took off, game was over. Just like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Get some water real quick here. Ah, so, we have three sections here, three diminishing sections. We have, God darn it, hang on a second. I'll get it, hold on, I can't see where I am. Oh, God darn it. Give me a second here. I got to go back and find okay. where I am. Yeah, this one, this one here. Okay, got it. Um, play there it is got so much stuff going on here all right if you look at this shot there's three distinct sections of water the first section here is bigger than this 
is bigger than that. There's a descending group of three where it gets smaller as you go because of perspective to it. Now, what, what is this? This is a mill. There are two of them. It's called a slough where the water goes in the Smokies. Um, this one and one over on the uh, 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 Cherokee side <clears throat> by the visitor center. When it rains, and that, that's about 12 feet tall, when there's a huge rainfall, these are like waterfalls. They are extremely fun to photograph. And the ones that are very tall, the one over uh, in, in Cherokee, looks like an immense waterfall when it rains. They're extremely photogenic. And again, these are things that I go to after a rain because I know this is going to be happening. And they're very photogenic, very different. Okay, this is huge. One of the first things I look for again, and David Munch is where I learned this from, and Pat O'Hara, too, my mentor, do this all the time, all the time. Frame within a frame, real simple. Frame number one's a big picture, frame number two is this. That's all it is. There'll be several examples coming up, but in general, it's not a, a, uh, a technique as much as it's a concept. You're putting something inside of something. It could be a bunch of blurred color. It could be a patch of water, anything, something inside of something, inside of a window, which is the most, most apparent frame in a building. So framing inside of the frame because your eye goes to that instantly. Framing in a frame. This wood snag just wound up there one day after the tide changed and like frame that tree. Next day it wasn't there. Because tides come in, things come and go on the beach. It's great. Do I see it? Mm. Framing in a frame. That's in Cuba. This is the, uh, the um, what's it called? They uh, have boats there. Million dollar yachts are uh, uh, in this uh, this place in Cuba. So I guess like they say, um, you know, some folks are more equal than others, right? <laughs> A little more subtle frame here. Look, look. You see that very delicate early spring? That's framing the rock. See it? It's just, it's just pointing to it, but it's not touching it. The frames are, like with all pictures, all this stuff is in your mind. It's in your imagination, okay? You have to look for it, you know? So I look for ways to like highlight a subject that's maybe not as apparent as you would think. It's kind of like points to it, kind of guides to it more gently than a big frame. If you follow these twigs, they all kind of lead to something, you know? And there's three of them. There are three V patterns. One, two, three. So it's threes and framing. So you're combining all these different techniques, which the more you use, the simpler the image, I know it sounds crazy, the simpler it gets. Tony? Yes, ma'am. a really interesting question. Okay, um, I'm sitting down. <laughs> Kathy Huckle, I believe you Hi, pronounce. Kathy. We, we were with you when you took the infrared image in Cuba. The, the Huckles, the, uh, uh, evidently a couple, so they were just saying hi, right? Yeah, what's the last name again? K uh, Huckles, H-O-C-K-E-L-S. They were there when, what, with you at that when, what, Yeah. Oh, my God, that, that's a while ago. Okay. That yeah. was a while we were there for a few years, yeah. Well, thanks for remembering. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and we're going to open this up when, you know, at the end. So she sure. can say hi to you then. Uh, yeah, we're almost, we have a little ways to go. We're almost, we're getting near the, uh, the uh, one halfway point. No, I'm just kidding. It's a joke. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll get more, more examples of framing. That's all it is. Putting something inside of something, framing something, drawing your attention to it. It's a specific subject. That's what framing does. It grabs your eye and says, go through here. Look at this. How can you not look at that? It, it, it makes you look, it, 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 it's involuntary. Good composition takes the viewer, not the other way around. This shot of the Cape May light is made literally by impaling yourself on that wrought iron fence with a wide angle lens, you're up against it. Because if you take one step back, the lighthouse starts touching the edges here. 
So you need a wide angle lens, 18 millimeters about right, 16, and 18. And you want to be impaled, like up against it to get enough space to be able to frame that another opening right there. I told clients about that. They went up shot and they went shot and said, man, we can't do it. I said, get 20 feet closer. <laughs> and then they got it. Same thing here. Framing in a frame. Right, yeah, I love this. This is uh, the uh, this is the Kalan uh, Cemetery in in in, uh, in Havana with 2.5 million above ground graves. I set my bag down and walked away. I just bought my mirrorless system, you know. I set it down. Somebody says, "Hey man, you can look at this." I said, "Oh great." I went and followed some Cuban guy, you know. And then I'm shooting later on. I'm reaching. I'm like, didn't that bring that with? Oh no. Oh no, oh no. So, you know, it was going. I had no idea where it was, but somehow this did. I just started like running amok. I had no idea. It ran like random, just panic. Sue would have killed me. You know, panic, you know. And I stopped and, oh, there it is. It just took me there. I never forget it. It's like somehow, you know, my brain said, it's not your day to die. So I kind of found where the thing was, you know. <laughs> anyway, framing in a frame, rod iron is great for that. Condition, we have a blue sky, no clouds, hot sun, about 11 o'clock in the morning. Everyone's going home. Whenever I see a frame, I've got a shot. Doesn't matter what it is. The power of the composition can overcome lane light every time, every time. So, so like a two minutes here, and it's got a frame. Doesn't matter what the sky is. It doesn't matter whether I have clouds. Doesn't matter what time it is. I've got a frame with a long exposure and a very good, simple composition. Use the light you have. One of my favorites. These look like sculptures to me. These trees getting blown around. You have no idea, or at least you maybe I don't. The power of water. It's unbelievable. These these snacks have to weigh like tons, thousands of pounds. They're they're huge. From one day to the next, they could be like in the water. They could be like back on the beach. 200 yards. I can't imagine the force to toss these things around like, to, like styrofoam. Incredible power. Incredible. And again, we're framed. This is, this is eight minutes of exposure. Eight minutes. While the water's got no detail. None. And I have a choice here. Do I get the deer in the road or jump in the fence? It's one or the other. Can't do both. I've got to get set up somewhere else to get him jumping <clears throat> or her jumping. But I thought this composition was more powerful than a shot of the deer just jumping the fence. So I waited and got him in the middle of the road and took the shot. Because <clears throat> what they do, pardon me, what they'll do is they'll start walking here way off to the left. You'll see him coming. But you know what they're going to do. They're going to jump, walk real slow, take their time, key it up, cue it up, and jump again. So I'll need to be over here or over here to get them jumping. And I missed this shot. Getting this kind of ice in the Smokies is rare. So it's more important to me to get this shot with the frame rather than the deer jumping the fence. Cades Cove, again, just tremendous. On days like this, Cades Cove is, is, is a great place for runners and bikers. And when there's fog like this, there's endless shots. You just set up a frame and you wait, you know which is how National Geo people shoot, by the way. They don't chase light. They set up great scenes and wait for things to happen. <clears throat> and we do the same basic thing. Ellis Island. Framing the statue is one of our goals there at Ellis. There's several rooms that give you a nice composition like that. Make your own frame. Make your own frame. You go to where boat stock, there's ropes. Get the rope, make a frame, shoot through it. Oh. That's all. That's all. Yeah. I'm sorry, Sandy, did you have a question there? No, I'm still just saying, okay. all of a sudden I said, oh my God, that's cool. I like the idea that you can yeah. make your own frame. Yeah, love it. Yeah, when you, get, yeah, when you go to like, you know, uh, uh, St. Michael, there's boats there, you know, or, or like uh, you know, Tillman Island, I mean, there's stuff on the dock, Cape May. You just make a frame with the rope and shoot through it. Piece of cake. Love it. Thank you. Sure, nothing to it. 
<clears throat> this is a helicon focus, which means focus stack, about 13 shots, because it's as sharp here as it is here. And what I found interesting about this, again, walking around for composition, walk around. No one ever went behind the pier, never, that I know of. So I walk behind it and it's like, oh man, look at this. This is a whole new thing. And then I see that the pitch, which blew me away, I could look at it real close. The pitch of this roof matches the pitch of this railing exactly, exactly here and almost exactly here. So that's, that's your frame. This is the frame that frames the subject. Even clouds can make a window for you. Shoot down through the clouds. And that's your frame. Frames are a concept. You want something to frame something. It could be anything. Out of focus flowers, clouds, you name it. As long as it's framing your subject. First thing I look for. It's a way to frame things. That's a big, big tree in Charleston. That's the old stable. That's some topaz stuff to make it look more, less photographic, basically. <clears throat> Little story here on the Palouse, pardon me. Um, they had a guy a couple of years ago, and it was a guy who uh, liked doing um, burning steel wool and doing those crazy orbs, you know what I mean? They do a circle and have these like circles with fire and stuff, you know? Well, the problem was that we were in a very heavy drought in the Palouse, and uh, there were fires going on. And this, this guy was putting these things up on Facebook. <laughs> and uh, the cops found him and talked, talked to him, you know. But it's like, man, you know. But they lost three barns last year because of that. And they lost a barn in this complex from that guy. The one from where we're looking, the barn was behind me. And that's gone. Half this complex is gone because of some Nimrod uh, playing with fire during the drought. Jeez, how do you, you can't make this stuff up, you know. <clears throat> And one of the last shots from the um, Botany Bay, great sunrise spot. Again, you go there and the frames are waiting. Trees are in the water, just find the sun and frame it, piece of cake. This tree's gone now. Okay, wide angle drama. Like we said in the beginning, and you get to us, you can get your wide angle out first, take your big wide angle shots, and then put the wide angle shot away, put it away, and get longer lenses. But in this case, you can also get closer to create drama, closer, big foreground than a rapid fall off to your background. Probably about maybe I don't know, two feet from the foreground there. Foot and a half, same base. Yeah, I love this, this area in the Badlands. <clears throat> it's unusual and it's really fun. Same thing here, down low, almost on ground level, getting the graphic down there. Big foreground, big foreground. It's also a pointer. The Cadillac Mountain, it's got a pointer. It says, hey, if you're not sure, look this way. <laughs> that's, what, that's what they're for. These things guide, it's kind of a joke, but they kind of, they're, they're subconscious like, like, uh, like road signs. Look this way, go that way. There's a way that you lead the viewer through your picture space. Look at the rocks, they'll point. Sorry, wrong one, here we go. They all point to where you should look. Big S curve. How can, how can you not do that? That's the first thing you see. Your eye goes right there because of this, because of that. That graphic right there is what grabs you. Then you follow it and then you're in. This is called the swirl. It's about an hour and a half walk into the uh, Coyote, not Coyote Butte, it's the, uh, the wave. You walk to the wave and then another uh, half an hour further back. <clears throat> but same basic idea. Okay, and one more thing. If you can, shoot in both formats. Doesn't always work. Sometimes it does. Just so you have it. I mean, you can crop to a horizontal, you can crop to a vertical. It's, it's easier to do it right the first time, you know. Maybe that sounds old-fashioned, but that's how I feel about it. Then the water calms down, and then we change our format. Repeating subject there. 
laying flowers, but it's a vertical and then it's a horizontal. Just flip it. One of my favorite water flows anywhere, but it's in the Smokies. It's the very top of Tremont. It's an incredible place. And in the, this is a color shot. Look at the color in the back. This is a color shot. But in the winter, and I think we're back there next, doing our winter thing next January, um, the snow melt creates white water. White. It's unbelievable. And then change of format. That is absolutely incredible. I love that water flow. We call that the ledge, by the way. Incredible. And then we have um, snag and then clouds move. I got to move with them. The problem with this snag is, is, is this. I like the V here, but I didn't like that. I could clone it out. I think I did, but that's too much trouble. So as the cloud moves, you move. And now that simplifies the composition. By the fact that it's moving, it simplifies it. Pulls you off to the side. You don't get the entire cloud formation, but this is actually kind of nice as a vertical. And then we have separation with the uh, foreground subject. And a couple shots of Cape May, pre-storm, not pre-storm, pre, pre, -storm, pre uh, things got blood red there for about a minute. So I went from this to about this for a two minute exposure. I've never ever seen that kind of red in water anywhere. And recap, here we go. Real quick, just recap. Uh, oh, it's always a good idea to view and analyze art. Do it all the time. Photography doesn't matter. Photography doesn't matter what it is. Any art, go to galleries, just feet, load up your mind with things to consider. Because when I saw this, because I love this shot. I've been to these places in Cushing, Maine. They're great. And that's uh, Christina's World is the painting. Andrew Wyeth and Christina was wheelchair bound. So they lifted her out and set her there as a subject and took the picture. Now, the next shot is live. <clears throat> I actually took it because of the feel of this shot. I saw this, saw this shot, next shot, and the light went on. Oh, wait a minute. That's a Wyeth. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, look at that. That's the painting, and that's the scene that I remembered. It's like, oh man, and there's the barns. I may have taken it regardless, but maybe not. Mm -hmm. Maybe not. <clears throat> and separation, notice all the pier pilings here are separated, again, Camera set up on the tripod to start and then loosen the head. Camera still on the tripod for support and then just moved it for a couple seconds. <clears throat> Using my voice just in time here. Hang on. <laughs> ah, okay. Rhythm and graphics. Rhythm and graphics. You don't always get great light, but you always can find good rhythm and good graphics. Always. That's what we have here. Look at the rhythm of the, uh, the top of this. This is the Kimmel Center in Philadelphia, by the way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Look at the light, how it shades, how it changes. This is a great three dimension. It looks like um, just has this three dimensional feel to it. Then you have the triangles over here. It's graphic here, little window here. They let you photograph in there, or they did. It's a fine arts center right around uh, downtown Philly. And if you're up there, you might want to have a look at it. It's very photogenic. It says at the sunset or late afternoon, and the light just starts bouncing around. It's great. Repetition, repeating ideas, all the way back. <clears throat> it's got a texture on it also. This pier is gone. I'm sure you all know that. Low horizon line, we mentioned that. Shot in uh, Peggy's Cove light. <clears throat> Pardon me, my voice is going here. That's Peggy's Cove light. And notice the top of the light is red. How's that possible? It's possible using Silver Effects Pro. You use the control point. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Okay. The, um, when you work in Silver Effects, your black and white layer is a separate layer and your background, your color layer, just put the black and white layer on top of your color layer. 
and then with the control point, which they have in Silver Effects Pro, put a control point on the top of the dome in this picture. It could be any picture, but on this one, the top of the dome, because the original dome is red. And with uh, the control point, the very bottom slider is called selective color. It's initialed S as in Sierra, C as in Charlie, SC, the bottom slider. When you move that slider, it brings the color up from your color shot into your black and white shot. And that's how that's done. Diamond graphics, I love any kind of like diamond shape. It's got a beautiful feel to it. It looks unique, uh, it's strong. It's like two triangles, very strong graphic. And I look for that shape. This is called a Madrona tree. It's specific to the Pacific Northwest. It's like a paper birch is in this part of the world. Just a, the, the, you know, the bark peels off so beautifully. You know, these are great subjects. I love this, uh, this subject. Get low, and we know why and how to get up, <laughs> but get low. Low perspective is very, uh, um, it has like an urgent feel, like you, you wanna look at it. It's like, wow, you're down here low and cut this like thing to it, you know. So I try to get low whenever I can. I think it's much more exciting than standing up visually. Repeating triangles, my goodness, one here, one over here, one over here, and one over here. It's got rhythm going through here. We have odd numbers, one, two, three, four, five. I have nothing to do with that. Right place at the right time, but being able to notice this stuff and be aware of it and to capitalize on it, that's kind of the, uh, or at the mercy of nature. It's being able to organize, as we said, being able to organize things in a space to make sense, kind of the name of the game. And you have what you have, so you have to deal with it. And just shot of triangles. Do I need a whole boat? No. Do I need any more of the boat? I don't think so. Do I need to, do I need to know it's a boat? No. I know it's a boat already because these, these ropes are attached to a boat. I know that. But it's a graphic. They have triangles that are created by these intersections here. Just very graphic, very clean. Reflection doesn't hurt. And we have circles in the Badlands. And a fisheye circle. This is, um, these carrots were, you know, I asked farmers come in and still work this land, you know, and do stuff. There's a rabbit family who lives under this car. <laughs> it's a little bunny rabbit family. And the farmer drops off carrots every so often so they can eat. Very adorable. Circles, more circles. Circle in the making is still a circle. Is that shot on the tripod? No, it's not. That's like, whoa, hurry up. Because <laughs> that didn't last too long. So I grabbed the camera, put it on program and shot. Program in modern cameras is phenomenal. I shoot infrared on program. <clears throat> I shoot everything in Cuba on program. Everything. All it does, it gives you a good histogram. That's all it does. You deal with it later, but it's much better than it was. And program mode is pretty viable for about half of what I do. You know, and I'm proud of it, by the way. <laughs> and framing, we said this. Just wait. This, this shot by itself is like, who cares? But it's a beach. Kids come out. People come out. You have a zillion frames with the pier. Just wait. It's bad light. I mean, it's not exciting light, but it's graphic. And it's a silhouette. And even in the worst conditions, you can get a good composition. You can. You know, it's no problem. Separation. The thing about this is I want to avoid merging. The busier the scene is, the more I watch for merging because it makes it more busy. And I want things simple. So if you notice, as far back as you can see, my main thought here was not to peer, was this. Was getting these pilings here not to merge. So the entire composition is also one here. The entire composition was, was predicated around those little 
little pilings, the holes here, so they didn't get too bunched up. You know what I mean? They didn't get too too busy. And that was the the whole point of of this composition, basically, is keep things separated. And water, rushing water. You want to photograph water when it recedes, not when it comes at you. It comes at you at at, uh, at 50 miles an hour it goes away at like you know five miles an hour so you basically have a lot more time to shoot when it recedes than when it comes rushing in that's a different shot but if you want the the water streaks that's water receding and i find that putting on a uh <clears throat> pardon me <clears throat> i'm losing it man a variable nd and keep dialing that back and forth this took this shot took around three seconds took around maybe like four or five test shots to get that exposure dialed in because the water receding varies all the time and patterns try to find patterns you know this is a side of a mountain again this is a summer in Iceland the greens get like vivid at the gargantuan side this is a real mountain stream here it's big It's like 20 miles away, this scene. So it was like a big mountain. Okay, watch for your merges. Learn something new on this one. My client says, uh, yeah, I took this shot. My client moved about 10 feet down the way. I'm here with the group. I say, what are you doing down there? You said you have merging there. Oh, you're right. You're right. But it's kind of unavoidable. You have a horizon line. But this is a merge. It's okay, but I don't like, I could do better. So I reshot it. You see, keep an eye out for merges. And then I recomposed, told the clients also, consider this. You all learned something today. Now, they're still merging, but it's not as bad. It's unavoidable. That is avoidable by recomposing. Come on, there it is. And my favorite quote to finish up <clears throat> by, um, I think it's this Austrian or Swiss patent clerk in the old days. I think it was Swiss patent clerk. Imagination is more important than knowledge by an old patent clerk. I believe him. And the last shot <clears throat> from the uh, Slot Canyon, black and white. A lot of selections here. Black and white photographers, Cole may touch on this, you know, one of the greatest, but um, you find that you use a lot of selections in black and white. This was a selection. This was a selection. That was a selection. So was this down here. So was this area and this. Each one of these is a selection. There's about 20 selections here. And then once you select them, you go into each area and you adjust the exposure, contrast, that kind of thing. That's, that's how to surgically select and affect very small areas rather than doing things globally, which can work, but not, uh, not that often. And a few books. Uh, this is available um, on our site. It's a digital book, it's an e-book. And then this just came out last year. Just, uh, this is a, uh, there's no map in this book. It just tells you locations. And um, you find a lot of, uh, of books when I said are, are like art books. Art books, are great, but, they, but they don't help a person go in there. They wouldn't help me because they look great, but you have to, you know. Yeah, I want to know where to go when I get there. I want to know space, places to go and what's there that I can do rather than waiting for like six months for the light to be right. And that's what this book is. It's just all locations, everything's listed where to go and what's happening there. So it's kind of a kind of a, a companion book for a trip to Iceland. And that's the last slide. This is what I do. Uh, if you have any, uh, any questions, please drop me an email. I do answer all emails, but please bear in mind that short emails get answered first. And um, are there any questions, Sandy? <laughs> Unmute yourself, Sandy. <laughs> you're muted. Good job, Tony. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.
Um, anyway, no, we don't have any now. We're getting now the comments. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. They've enjoyed it. I'm hoping that they will uh, unmute themselves by pressing on uh, the space bar to ask a question. Let's see if anybody does. Sure. I just uh, want to say thank you very much, Tony. Who am I talking to here? Hello. Oh, you're very welcome, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Tony, this is Tom Anderson. I, I was really impressed hey, by the ground you've covered. Uh, thank intrigued you. intrigued by that. You've been doing this a while, but... Uh, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> what, what, what got you on that path to cover a lot of ground to find beautiful places? Oh, man, when I first started in Cincinnati, I, uh, I met all the right people. I've just been lucky, you know, whenever, you know, whenever I've changed endeavors, which I've done like three major times, I've always met the right people. I, I was just lucky. You know, like, where do I go? You know, and of course, being in Tennessee, when I started this, the Smoky Mountains is a no-brainer. You know, that's where everybody goes to shoot. So that's where I learned, you know. And then I hooked up with Bill Fortney. Bill started The Great American back then. And that's where I, he sent me a... Uh, I was on the mailing list. And I just got a list of all these places. I, I, I've got to go to all these places. Oh, geez, Bill. So I called Bill and I begged him. I said, man, just let me come with you. I'll work for free. Just let me come and hang out. He said, yeah, sure. I can't pay. I said, man, I don't want to get paid. I was going to be able to show up and go with you guys. And that's how I learned. Mm, I took my college money, my college money, and put it toward traveling and buying gear. And that's how I learned first, uh, first several years was that. I had a great mentor and then a couple of years with Bill was pretty much off, off after that. So I've been very lucky with people. <clears throat> thanks. Thank you. Tony, thanks much. This is Roger. Hey, Roger, man. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the nice travel. It was just amazing. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. This is Bill Conway. Thanks, Tony. Hey, Bill, good to see you, buddy. Thank you. Or good to see you, you know, see you. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thanks, Bill. If you guys have any questions that you can, you may think of later, just drop me an email. You know. No. No problem. That's recording. So is that pretty much, uh, pretty much it, guys? Oh, thanks very much. Hey, Paul. What's up, buddy? You look good. I can't see you. That's somebody else. You look like your, like your name. Never mind. It's good to see you, Paul. Hey, uh, Tony. This is Tom Anderson. One, one quick question before you leave. Yes, sir. Sure. How much pre-visualization of the shots do you do, and does that involve uh, a lot of repeat visits? Uh, to the second question. Probably, yeah. You know, you have, uh, you, know, you have your uh, uh, tourist pictures the first time. We all do it. And then you go back and you get deeper and deeper and deeper as you go back. You start, uh, you get the, uh, uh, the usual shots done. We all got to do them. And it's a good thing to do. But then you want to get beyond that. And the only way to do that is to revisit a place relentlessly, you know. I still find new stuff in the Smokies. I find still find new stuff in Lock Graven, new stuff around the corner. <clears throat> the pictures are inside of you, man. They're inside of you, you know. And when you go to places more often, it just frees you up. You're not like, oh my, I got to get this shot. I got to get that shot. Once you're past that point, that's where you want to be. Then you can relax, let things open up, and just walk around and see what happens. <clears throat> uh, thanks for the insight. Oh, sure. Jeez, let me answer your question. So, Tony, we have been getting in the chat room, I just have to share with you, um, just so many uh, messages of gratitude. Uh, oh, my goodness. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's very thorough and educative uh, review of composition, um, interesting, informative. Um, it, it, so it just goes on and on. Fantastic. Awesome. It just goes on and on. So I just wanted to share that with you. 
uh, very responsive. We had 99. Well, thank you very much. We had 99 participants at one point. And it's, oh my goodness. It, yeah, it stayed in the 90s up until just a, a little while ago. Get out of here. Wow. Thank yeah. you all. That's, a, that's, I'm flattered. Thank you very much. Yeah, Appreciate that. Thrill. That's great. Well, thank you. So I guess, um, Janet Jeffries is here. Jeffers is here. Thanks, Tony. Nice to see you again. Oh, Janet. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't. Hey, Janet. What's up? up. <laughs> Where are you? I think anyway, one, thing, one thing I stumbled on regarding Zoom is if you have the chat window open, you can't uh, speak. You have to close the chat window. Oh, that's good to know. Oh, I didn't know that either. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't getting heard and I had my chat win, window open and when I closed it, it finally broke through. Now that's a lesson right there, isn't it? <laughs> it is for me. <laughs> yeah, serendipitous. All right. So, okay, um, but Tony, I want to say thank you so much. And I've been on a shoot with you and Karen Messick a long time ago. I just want oh to know is the, is the bandana absolutely necessary? Because I put mine on in honor of you. <laughs> thank you, dear. It, 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 it's a part of my persona by now, I think. I've had it for so long. But thank you. It's very, uh, oh. thank you. It's a nice tribute. <laughs> Oh, always awesome, awesome inspiration from your photos and your comments. Oh, you're very Thanks kind. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. I, I just captured a screenshot of uh, you, Karen, with Tony and the bandana. So anyway, I'll share it with Excellent. you. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> I'm doomed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, adios. Yeah, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you, Tony. Oh my God, it's 20. I got to go eat something. <laughs> what? I got to go eat. I'm starving here. It's 20 at 10. Jesus, God. Yeah, I know. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Great. Thank you. It's great meeting you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, so everybody. Bye. Just, Bye. Great privilege. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very great much. Job. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go. Uh, Sandy, I all right? <laughs>